Hello everyone, Dr. Sunil Dand. Welcome to another video. I'd like to thank those of you who follow me here, who watch my videos, do so because you want open, honest debate. You want to arrive at your own conclusions. You don't want anything shoved in your face. And above all else, you want to live in reality. So on that note, let's talk about a latest study result that I saw for a new drug, maybe a new miracle drug. And I feel that what I'm about to tell you is emblematic of where we're going wrong, not just in evidence-based medicine, evidence-based medicine, but also in society in general. So let me share with you this study result. So this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is supposedly one of the more reputable medical journals, Tazapatide once weekly for the treatment of obesity. I'm going to share with you the abstract in the interest of time, but I will put a link to the full article down below. Feel free to look at that. Obesity is a chronic disease that results in substantial global morbidity and mortality. The efficacy and safety of tazapatide, a novel glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, that's hormone GIP, and glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, that's GLP-1, in people with obesity are not known. So they've got that right for a start. Obesity is a global disease that results in massive comorbidities and illnesses. And they've touched upon two very important hormones there known as incretin hormones, GIP and GLP-1. Let's dive into the study then. In the methods of this study, in this phase three double blind randomized control trial, we assigned 2,539 adults with a body mass index, that's BMI, which is the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared of 30 or more. That is the categorization of obesity, a BMI more than 30 or 27 or more, and at least one weight-related complication, excluding diabetes in an equal ratio to receive once-weekly subcutaneous tazapatide, so it is a once-weekly subcutaneous injection, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, or 15 milligrams, or placebo for 72 weeks, so almost a year and a half, including a 20-week dose escalation period. Co-primary endpoints were the percentage change in weight from baseline and a weight reduction of 5% or more. So it is a double-blind randomized trial which is considered one of the strongest types of medical studies and trials that one can do. And they studied the people for a fair amount of time, a year and a half, not like a few weeks or a couple of months like we see in some studies. These participants were studied for 72 weeks. So what were their results? At baseline, the mean body weight was 104.8 kilograms. The mean BMI was 38. So that's touching upon morbid obesity, which is a BMI of 40. And 94.5% of participants had a BMI of 30 or higher. The mean percentage change in weight at week 72 was minus 15% with 5 milligram weekly doses of tazapatide, minus 19.5% with 10 milligram doses, and minus 20.9% with 15 milligram doses, and minus 3.1% with placebo. That's interesting that even placebo had a weight loss. The percentage of participants who had weight reduction of 5% or more was 85%, 89%, and 91% with 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, and 15 milligrams of tazapatide respectively, and 35% with placebo. Again, interesting, 35% reduction of 5% or more with placebo. 50% and 57% of participants in the 10 milligram and 15 milligram groups had a reduction in body weight of 20% or more as compared with 3% in the placebo group. Improvements in all pre-specified cardiometabolic measures were observed with tazapatide. The most common adverse events with tazapatide were gastrointestinal and most were mild to moderate in severity, occurring primarily during dose escalation. Adverse events caused treatment discontinuation in 4.3%, 7.1%, 6.2%, and 2.6% of participants receiving 5mg, 10mg, and 15mg tazapatide doses and placebo, respectively. So not an insignificant adverse event rate there among the participants leading to study discontinuation in those particular people. But what were the final conclusions then of these authors when they were looking at the results of the study? What did they conclude? In this 72-week trial in participants with obesity, 5 mg, 10 mg or 15 mg of tazapatide once weekly provided substantial and sustained reductions in body weight. Study supported by Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical company making the drug. 
So again, a link to the full study is down below. Feel free to read it. That was the abstract only. So I do have a few thoughts, questions, and concerns regarding this study, the conclusions, and the real-world implications, as you might expect. But let me first start off very briefly by talking about root causes of this problem we face. Because we live in a society that never wants to address root causes. We're all about band-aids and quick fixes. That's why we never solve any problems. The problems keep getting worse and worse, and all of our institutions are at fault. Modern mainstream medicine is at fault. Our public health organizations are at fault. The government is at fault. Modern mainstream media is at fault. Nobody wants to address root causes. Why do we have this problem of obesity, which is at unprecedented, soaring levels? It's off the charts in both adults and children. It hasn't happened because our genetics have suddenly changed. That's what some people say. Genetics don't just change over a few decades. Look at pictures of your grandparents' and great-grandparents' generations. They looked completely different to how we look today. We have to face reality. And this has happened for a simple reason, a main reason, we eat the wrong types of food. Of course, being sedentary doesn't help either, but by far the number one reason is that we don't eat the real food that previous generations used to eat. Western societies, with the United States being the worst offender, are loaded up with terrible junk foods, highly processed packaged foods, people eat way too many sugars, that's a big culprit, and carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates. Those are the three devils of modern day eating processed and packaged foods, sugars and carbohydrates, especially the refined low-fiber carbohydrates. Of course, we simply eat way too much as well. But not eating real food is the major reason why we are faced with the obesity pandemic and all of the illnesses that go with that, like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. We really are in a bad situation, and it's not always the fault of the person. I will always list personal responsibility up there as a number one factor in any lifestyle outcome. But in all honesty, there are other factors involved as well here related to food manufacturers, food conglomerates. I think the food industry shoulders a massive part of the blame over the last few decades, but also the medical establishments all around the Western world are not without fault because they have let this slip under the radar and they're still not talking about it. So let's talk about this particular study then and my own concerns regarding the results, conclusions and where this means we are heading. Firstly, this study was done over 72 weeks, so of course it's better than studies which were only done over a few weeks or months, but what we know about obesity is that the health effects can take years to develop those conditions like type 2 diabetes. So while the study is saying that there may have been improved cardiometabolic profile results, the fact is that this may not make any difference necessarily to long-term outcomes because it takes a long time for the health effects of obesity to manifest. So are we simply treating a number or are we improving outcomes? That's the first thing I would like to say. The second very important thing to remember is that the BMIs of these people were very high indeed. And the truth is that a 5, 15%, 20% weight loss in people with such a high BMI, as good as it is, of course we want people to lose weight at that weight, it still will mean that many of them are obese and will still be prone to the health effects of obesity even after that weight loss. That's an important thing to remember. Also consider this, how the medication works. We touched upon the hormones, those incretin hormones, GLP-1 and GIP, and I could talk for a long time about those hormones I will do in the future because they play a crucial role in satiety, appetite management, how insulin is secreted, and a process known as de novo lipogenesis. We'll talk more in the future. But my point is this. We can throw pharmaceuticals or even surgery at problems to try to bypass the natural body physiological and biochemistry systems, but in the end, we are going to still reach a tipping point if the downstream problem is still there. Do you see what I'm getting at? We are merely trying to play around with the body's natural physiology and hormonal secretions. And my point is, in most people out there, this can also be achieved very easily naturally, i.e. by eating real food. So we did talk about the adverse event rate there, which is not insignificant by any means. 
What happens when this medication is rolled out to thousands or hundreds of thousands of people? How many people are going to have adverse events or side effects, especially at the higher doses? That would be another concern of mine. How much is this drug going to cost? They're not going to give it away for free, are they? Well, estimates suggest that this particular pharmaceutical produced by Eli Lilly is going to cost $13,000 a year. I repeat, $13,000 a year. And you thought real food was expensive. Finally, we must also add that we know that when a study is funded and supported by the very company that will benefit from the particular product, that you have to go over everything with a fine tooth comb. We know the phrase, don't we? 90% plus of scientists will always agree with whoever is funding them, maybe even 90% plus of doctors. It is a fact of life. That's why we need the right checks and balances. So what happens next then? My big concern in true evidence-based medicine, 2022 style, evidence-based medicine, follow the science style, what will happen next is that this drug will be rolled out to people who weren't even initially studied, i.e. people with a much lower BMI. Maybe even it will be prescribed to overweight people who want to lose a bit of weight. But that is not following the science. It's not following evidence-based medicine if these people were not even studied in the first place. So let me know what your thoughts are. Do you think this is a new miracle drug to solve one of the biggest problems that we currently face in the Western world, obesity? Am I being too cynical? Am I being pessimistic? Let me know your thoughts down below. Thanks everybody for listening, Dr. Cindy Oldan. Do hit the subscribe button down below for more similar videos in the future. Also hit the bell button so you get notified when I make more videos in the future. You can also follow me on my uncensored platform. That link is down below where we have more open, honest discussions away from this censored, constrained environment. Hey, I thought countries like the United States and United Kingdom were free countries where we could speak openly and honestly. Maybe not. My newsletter link is also down below. We will talk again very soon.